listening to this tonight, Roger Hallam, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, the climate activist group. Thank you for joining the programme this evening, Mr Hallam. Um, I, I wonder what your reaction is to the, the UN report today. Well, to be honest, sort of total despair and total rage. I haven't thought about much else all day. And I think millions of other people have probably spent the day in some sort of intense emotional sort of state and um yeah i'm quite worked out exactly what i should be feeling but that's what i have been feeling what's the rage well i'm 55 i'm a farmer and um about 15 years ago we had an extreme weather event in Wales. It rained every day for seven weeks. I lost all my crops. And at that point, I was a bit of a happy-go-lucky sort of guy. And then it dawned on me that this was something structural. And I've been waiting for those 15 years for governments to wake up to their responsibilities and stop mm. the mass death and mass destruction that's now effectively locked in. So I suppose it's pretty human reaction. So this is vindication for you? Well, vindication is a bit of a... Well, at least it backs up what you've been saying. It, 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 you know, it's not about, hey, I was right or anything stupid like that. It's more like, it's more like these people knew and they didn't act. And that's quite an indictment, isn't it, given the extremity of what's coming down but the road Let's talk for about our children. Let's talk about how extreme it's going to get. You say the science says that climate change is going to get your words exponentially worse. Where in this report does it suggest an exponential worsening? Well, the exponentiality of it is linked to the tipping points in the global sort of system. So the most obvious one, and you'll find this in many papers and articles, the most obvious one is as the Arctic melts, and mm -hmm. it's nothing very complicated, you know, ice melts when it gets warm. Uh, as it melts, then the, the white ice doesn't reflect the sun's rays and it goes into the dark water. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows that that was, will heat up the temperatures, which is why in the Arctic, the temperatures are going up two, three, four times more than they are in the rest yes, of the, the world. Yes, but point, the point at which that can happen varies depending on the scientific modelling. The modelling of the IPCC suggests that there could be global temperature rises of actually less than one degree, which obviously would be consequential, but, but nowhere near what you have described not only as exponentially worse, but also in saying uh, that six billion people will die of climate change this century. Yeah, well, I'm saying that that's the direction in which we're travelling is for a four degree world. And a four degree world is half the Earth's surface being effectively uninhabitable. And that that is a viable scenario. And some of, some people would say an inevitable. Well, it's a scenario. scenario if we do nothing. The IPCC say if we do nothing from here, we will rise by four degrees. But we're, we're not doing nothing. No. And there's so, no suggestion. I don't know where this six billion figure comes from. Because that, to, to a lot of people, Roger, that would sound incredibly alarmist. It's a bit like putting your kids on a plane and being told there's a 5% chance that they're going to crash. It, it's, but who's it saying 6 be, billion people? It doesn't Sorry, have but... to be inevitable. All it has to be is so bad that you wouldn't even think about going there. Who says 6 billion people will die, other than your good self, 6 billion people will die of climate change this century? Who, where is that being said? Because it's not in this it, report. It, it, it's been said by uh, Kevin Anderson and uh, Rostrum, who used to be director of the Potsdam Institute. You mm -hmm. can look up the quotes. So there's a whole bunch of climate scientists who have said, as we reach four degrees centigrade, we're basically looking at a billion people being alive around the two poles. But that isn't peer-reviewed, is tropics won't That's be. not a peer-reviewed paper. There is no peer-reviewed science that suggests six billion people will die of climate change this century. Let me come on to what it is you're arguing needs to be done. You want zero emissions in four years. How does that happen without, without destroying the economy, without destroying capitalism? The, the, the situation is, is we've got a rather unpleasant choice to make. And I think for 
you know, a few decades, people like you have been trying to frame this, that everything's been okay, and then there's these unpleasant people that want to, you know, destroy the economy and such like. And I respect that point of view, because for a long time, arguably, that was the case. What I would argue at this moment in time is the choice is the economy is going to be destroyed anyway, if we don't do anything drastic about the climate sure. crisis. So we either have to, you know, take a stitch now or we're going to have nine. No, I agree. I, 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 listen, I totally agree. In a, in yeah. a choice well, between I, save I, the planet or don't wanna, save the planet, you want I, to save I, the planet. But it I, depends I, on your definition of drastic, Mr. Hallam, because it, it it's does, zero emissions in just, four... Hang on a sec. Yeah. Hang on a sec. Zero emissions in four years means the banning of all flights. It means, as, as Extinction Rebellion have argued for previously confiscating 90% of the assets of the wealthiest. It means factories being shut. How, how is that going to help? How is, how is confiscating 90% of the assets of the wealthiest going to help climate change? It, it's about not betting the farm, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's a difficult... I don't want to have a big argument with you about it. No, I, I don't mean, want I have to an argue with you. With and, Andrew Neil, right? <laughs> Maybe we can try and accept that we're in a really difficult situation. Like, I, I'm i not in the business of wanting people to suffer now for no particularly good reason. What I'm trying to communicate is we're going to have to make massive sacrifices because we've left it too late. Now, what those massive sacrifices are, you know, we can argue about the extent of them. Yep. But what I think we can come together on is... If we don't want to pull our kids on that plane, then it's pretty obvious that we need to make pretty big Absolute, sacrifices uh, I, now. Roger, I agree with you on that. The, the difficulty is and the frustration, I think, people like me who accept the science totally. I'm, I'm, in no way am I trying to suggest that this isn't happening. It's happening and I want to do my bit like everybody. I, I want to try and help. I want to make sure it's all right. I want to leave a planet that is uh, habitable to my children and their grandchildren and their children. So uh, we, we're on board with this. The pe groups like Extinction Rebellion, I think, have made it worse, have made it more difficult to communicate to, to groups and people like me who accept and get it and want to do stuff. When you say things like six billion people will die, die of climate change this century, when there's there's no peer review paper that says that, when you want to confiscate 90 percent of the ath assets of the wealthiest, how's that going to help? When there's a, an accept, a, a belief that capitalism is the thing that isn't going to be helpful in trying to deal with this, when you have firms like uh, Tesla, Eat Just, uh, these are private firms when the government says they want to create markets for green energy. Do you see that as part of the solution to this, to, to get us where, to where we all need to be or not? Well, I, I can only speak for myself. And just for the record, I'm not speaking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion in this interview. Um, my view for what it's worth is that there will have to be massive state intervention in the economy at this stage of the game. And I'm saying that as a social scientist. I'm not saying that because I think socialism is good or bad or whatever, or capitalism is good or bad. At the end of the day, when there's a crisis of the severity that we now face, then the state will have to be intervene in the economy to make the changes, mm -hmm. right? I'm perfectly aware that that's like a highly difficult proposition to make, but I'm trying to be honest with you and your audience about what is necessary at this stage yep. of the game, Agreed. right? If, if we were 30 years ago, I would agree with you. We know we just need to encourage a few green cars and, you know, get people to eat a little bit of, of less meat. At, at the moment, at the moment, we're heading over 420 parts per million of CO2. Once we get to 450, and there are papers on this, it will be basically the game over because the feedback systems will lead to the collapse of civilization. Now, we can argue, you know, over the finer points of it, but the fundamental issue here is not, you know, 90%, 80% of things need to be collectivized or whatever you, you, you want to sort of pick off on me. The, the main point we need to acknowledge is we're in a complete mess but do you right? acknowledge do you and we, acknowledge and, that, and we have to have a public debate about I that i get that but do you acknowledge that some of these private firms whether it's some i've mentioned the teslas that whatever these these companies 
they are helping in trying to tackle this problem too or because there are, there's a I think there's a narrative developed by groups like I know you're not representing them here extinction rebellion which says all that stuff all the profit motive stuff is inherently detrimental to the environment mm. and I don't think I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to where we need to be in order to solve this or to reduce this problem without these companies without their innovation well, I, I think the model that people in Extinction Rebellion have been following is the World War II mobilization model. And the good thing about that is we've, we've got a sort of historical example there of how you can change the economy in a very small, uh, short period of time. So as you, as you may know, when Pearl Harbor happened, the American economy was put on a war footing, mm -hmm. you know, in less than a year. And, and it was a combination, as you might say, of state intervention and large companies jumping to it. But there was an element of compulsion and there was an element of private enterprise. So I'm more than happy it, for private enterprise to take the reins as it were. We're all aware that that can produce innovation and all the rest of it. The question is, will it? <laughs> okay. Well, it is. So, so in a wartime situation, uh, like when there's an existential emergency, the safest way of getting stuff done is through a state approach, which is for the state to say, you have to produce so many vehicles which yep. are zero carbon by such a date. And if Fine. you don't, then there'll be trouble. And some now of those states, some of those states, Roger, I've got to wrap this up. I'm really sorry. I could talk to you for a long time, but I've got to wrap this up. So very quickly, China emits 27% of global emissions. What is it that do you think there can be done to try and stop that? Well, as, as we're all aware, you know, if you're going to have a sensible discussion about China, the first thing that we have to accept is we don't have a lot of influence over China, but we do have a lot of influence over the British government. And what, what Extinction Rebellion is saying, as far as I'm concerned, is we're in the UK and we need to force the British government to do more, right? Okay. I think everyone can agree That's on that. That's fine. The most effective way of doing that is through mass civil disobedience, which is one of the reasons you're talking to me tonight, right? because it causes disruption in society, forces people to think about the issue and forces the government to take the issue seriously. Now, that's my remit, right? If you want to talk to an expert about exactly what needs to be done, you can talk to other people. But if we don't have, but, if the British government doesn't have much influence, I agree with you, if we can all stand here and protest at China's um, pumping out of, of CO, do you think anything can persuade the Chinese government to stop building the coal-fired power stations because as much as there might be uh, endless mass climate change protests in London in the coming weeks as I see X XRR promoting that as you would as you acknowledge that's not going to do anything in China no so I'm interested to know what you think I haven't got a clue I've <laughs> no got, I haven't I've, I, haven't got I, I, am, I haven't got I haven't got much of a clue either so you know welcome to the problem okay the, the, this is you know if there's going to be some advance on the subject we should stop taking cheap shots at each other, OK? We've got a massive problem. I, I haven't got a solution to how to persuade the, the Chinese government to stop um, coal I'm not asking you. I'm, I, I, the question I asked was whether you think anything can. Well, never say never. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can give you a theory of change, which is, if, which is if, the, if the British government actually enacts some of these, these dr dramatic measures, then it was is likely i'm not saying it's certain but it's likely that it will be copied by other governments the other way in which it can work is if there's mass disruption in this country and in other western countries it's possible that mass disruption will move around the world because surprise surprise the chinese population mm. isn't isn't particularly interested in dying either so on now, that on that mass disruption point roger and this is going to have to be the final question i'm afraid on that mass disruption point what can people expect from extinction rebellion in london in the next few weeks well, as I say, I'm not formally speaking on behalf of, of, of the organisation, but my understanding is there will be mass civil disobedience in London, blocking roads and various other activities. And the plan is that that will lead to more publicity, put pressure on the on the on the British government. But what, what I would say is, is I think over the coming months, particularly in the run up towards COP, you'll find tens of thousands of people and particularly increasingly young people taking to the streets and engaging in civil disobedience, but for no other reason that they're terrified for their futures. And who can blame them, I suppose? 
I'd love to have you back on again, Roger, as we approach that conference. Maybe we can do it for longer next time as well. Good to speak to you. Roger Hallam, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion. <laughs>